We got a cross post today from the Alpha Hippie podcast, did an interview with my buddy Angelo, and he posted it on his podcast a week or two ago, and got some good feedback on it, so I figured I would share that here as well for anyone who is interested in hearing me and Angelo talk about Facebook and death metal and gym ownership. So if you like this podcast, it's worth uh, checking out Angelo's entire feed. It's called the Alpha Hippie, which is an appropriate name for Angelo. Um, an excellent uh, uh, conglomeration of words to, to describe this individual. So um, that's in iTunes, Overcast, Stitch, or whatever you guys use to check out podcasts. Just search for Alpha Hippie. And the website is alphahippiepodcast.com, I believe. Let me check. Yes, alphahippiepodcast.com. So if you like this, follow Angelo on his other forms of social and podcast creation. Let me know if this is enjoyable for you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening to the Alpha Hippie Podcast. On today's show, I have my dear friend, amazing gym owner and coach, Todd Neef. Some of you may refer to him as Todd Knife or Todd Death, but I'm here to reassure you that it's Todd Knife. We talk about everything from uh, owning uh, a gym, being an introvert, what it was like growing up for Todd, how he's a musician, and how that's applied to his uh, life now as a coach. Uh, me and him just really shoot the shit on this one. Todd and I have um, have a history of having these great in-depth conversations, and I thought it would be fun to, to hit record on one of them. So I really hope that you enjoy the show. If you do, subscribe to us on iTunes, leave a beautiful review telling me how amazing I am, <laughs> follow us on Instagram and anywhere else you can find Alpha Hippie. I really appreciate your support. Much love to you guys. Take care. Welcome to the Alpha Hippie Podcast, a show for the warrior who leads with love and kindness. Todd Neef. Neff. Some people call him Neff. <laughs> if you're a Neff caller, that's okay, but it's really Neef. He won't correct you um, unless he really feels like it's important. Most of the time, he doesn't. And he's live and in person in oh, my yeah, people apartment. Do, people, uh, since I have often been called Todd Knife, um, people think my name is actually pronounced Knife. Oh. It's not. Wow. Also false. Okay, so Knife... Neff, it's Neef, and that's final. Yep. What nationality is that? Um, so the Neef name comes from the Alsace-Lorraine territory, which is between Germany and France. Um, I think there are some Neefs who currently live in France, uh, but I am as Irish as a person can be who has a non-Irish last name. <laughs> How does that happen? God, you know, if you take, if you take the... The, the generation where you have eight grandparents, seven of the eight are completely Irish, and then we live in a patriarchy with messed up name lineages, and there you go. What do you think about that stuff, that 23 and Me? What about it? So I got it for Christmas. Okay. And Did you swab your cheek? I'm a little freaked out about it. Why? Because they sell Did you your... Did it or no? No, I didn't do it. Okay. They, they sell your... I didn't even open it out of the plastic. They sell your DNA. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, just in case I ever rob a bank or anything and shit has to go the other way, I don't want to, uh, to let people get a sample of me. Do you think that that's weird? Uh, I mean, I think there, there's probably that. Yes, that is weird. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have concerns over the, the fact that they're essentially collecting your genetic information and like selling that as part of their business model. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm personally not really worried about it. I do you think I should do it? You can do whatever you want. Did you do it? Yeah. Okay. I did it a long time ago. Fuck. A bunch of people's like, oh, it's great. And like, I was really nervous. Yeah. I mean, I don't feel like doing it gave me any major insight into anything. It's interesting. I yeah. Mean, you get some interesting reports and there's some other services you can use to plug your genome into and see what you have. Um, for various like snips and different things and yeah it's kind of cool all right poke around a little bit it's like oh you're bad at metabolizing caffeine it's like yeah obviously i just feel terrible if i have <laughs> two cups of coffee i knew that already sure um but i don't know man are you are you afraid of like your data being tracked by facebook and all that kind of stuff you know i get that's a great question so 
I feel like if I put something out on the internet or do something on the internet, that's not mine anymore. And, but like this is me deciding if I want to put it out. I think that's like the biggest thing. Like if you put something on Instagram, you put something on social media, you, you type www dot somewhere, you're putting your shit out there. And that's how I feel like with this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really, I mean like that's what I think about if I do anything on the internet. So obviously what I'm putting out there, I hope is okay. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I hope it's okay. It's all right. But yeah, I mean, what about you? Do you think that that's weird that, that Facebook does all that? Um, well, yes. Uh, I certainly think that the business model is toxic, right? As far as, okay, we essentially, the goal is to drive as much engagement as possible on the platform so that we can uh, sell advertisements to people and then also um, have this entire network of essentially tracking users' behavior and figuring out what they do and selling that data to people in order to advertise. Um, I think the incentives are totally misaligned. Facebook's incentive is essentially to um, ramp up engagement as much as possible through appealing to like lower instincts, so to speak. Uh, I mean, you know, it's pretty obvious that outrage and uh, divisiveness and tribalism are things that increase engagement on social media and that that is good for advertisers and good for the platforms and bad for the people using them. So um, I am certainly opposed to um, those business models. Um, but I'm not too terribly worried about like my own individual behavior being tracked, but I am concerned with the overall uh, like implication as far as like removing gatekeepers, so to speak, right? There's not like trusted media sources. People are just on social media and then they're uh, being driven into like whatever various emotional states by the, the content being shared on there, which I think is bad for pretty much everyone. Do you think, or here you go. I, I mean, I don't, I doubt this is how, Mark started off this oh, no. company. Yeah, he's, so yeah. at what point, if we had to reenact it, do you feel like he was just like, fuck it, let's do this? Yeah, I don't know if there was ever a point of that. Because, I mean, if you listen to interviews with him too, I don't know that he actually thinks that that's the way it works. Right? You know what I mean? Like that, that I think anyone who's running a business probably has um, some acceptance of the reality of what they're selling and just like, okay, like we need to actually take in revenue in order to operate and exist and to support our mission. Sure. Right. And I think that he legitimately believes that by creating an open platform uh, to connect people, that that's like a net positive for the world. Right. Um, and you know, that, that maybe he is aware of, some, I mean, he's obviously aware of some of the negative things that have happened with like election, election, you know, manipulation and uh, like some of the, um, you know, terrorist organizations utilizing social media to uh, fuel hate groups and all that kind of stuff that, you know, he, he obviously knows that that's happening, but I think that he sees those as an exception. And I think that there's like a libertarian philosophy in Silicon Valley uh, that is strongly biased towards free speech. A lot of these things see themselves as platforms and that he believes, I mean, I assume that um, increasing connection across the world through social media is a net benefit and that, you know, there's always going to be bad actors and that Facebook has to make money in order to exist to support its mission, so that that's fine. Um, so I, I don't know if there ever was a moment where he was like, fuck it. But at what point do you think he figured out that that's how that platform was going to make it? Mm. Well... Because I, re I remember a time at Facebook when there wasn't ads everywhere. Yeah, sure. Well, I think that you, you, you obviously, you know, once you have a, a user base, you have the monetization conversation. Okay, how do we actually do this? Um, and I don't know what the what the timeline was as far as like when they accepted venture capital funding and what all that process looked like. But you know, you you, you hit that point. You're like, all right, do we sell ads? Do we sell some sort of like premium service on top of this? Do we sell our data to companies? Like, how do we actually make money now that we have you know a billion people on the platform or whatever the number was when they were actually having that conversation? Um, and I, I have no insight into why they chose the advertising model, but, but I don't think that they chose the advertising model with any sort of nefarious intent in mind, right? I mean, it's like, you know, are, are, are the ads in newspapers like creating this horrible, um, like attention sucking, uh, business model? Like not really the ads in newspapers support, you know, long form investigative journalism, right? So why is that not the case on Facebook? 
Well, do you think it's because also too, Facebook knows that you're 35, you do CrossFit, like, I mean, like much more than the, the Super Bowl commercial, like, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're best guessing, but like Facebook knows intimately yeah. all of that. Yeah. And I think that's like, I'm not worried about privacy, but that's just, I think it's almost like at the point where it's so, I don't want to say too powerful, but yeah, maybe too powerful Yeah. to like even combat that and overcome it. Well, in, 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 with anything like that, with network effects, you run into these issues of, um, you know, people are only going to spend money for advertising where people are, right? So you have uh, Facebook and Google can just command such a lion's share of like digital marketing spend because they've um, sort of capitalized upon that network effect. So, you know, there is a lot of discussion surrounding, okay, are these monopolies and this is something that needs to be broken up and all that kind of stuff. And I certainly wouldn't have the sophistication to talk about, you know, where the lines are and various antitrust laws and anti-monopoly laws but i think that's a, a totally valid concern that you have these hyper powerful um digital platforms that are essentially you know aggregating all of this content and selling almost all the advertising on the internet because they are the source for all this content and where all the people are yeah it's it's so you know like it's so crazy to think about like how I don't want to say under, maybe for me under my nose, but like, like how big Google got so fast. Yeah. Like one day there was Yahoo and one day it was just like, fuck you and fuck Jeeves. Dude, Jeeves. Jeeves. <laughs> Remember Ask Jeeves? Ask Jeeves. <laughs> Poor Jeeves. Yeah. <laughs> he got shit on. Yeah. Bing. Yeah. Bing's yeah. out there fighting. Lycos. Alta Vista. <laughs> <laughs> Remember all those? And it's just like so crazy to think about though, how much of our lives is between either something of Facebook and Google. Yeah. Yep. Insane. It's insane how um, how large it got and so fast. I think fast. 10 like, years, ten, I mean, within a decade. Yeah, I mean, maybe even less than that. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I, I, I certainly remember a time when search engines like kind of didn't work. I were like, using the internet sucks. Like, yeah. you can't find anything. Didn't have every answer. Yeah, like you'd search for something and you just look at all the results and be like, this is just dumb. This is not what I want. And then Google just solved that problem. And here we are. That's incredible. Have you ever read the book um, Stealing Fire? No. What is that? I, I feel like I know about this, but I don't know what it is. So Stephen Kotler, he wrote a book called The Rise of Superman. Yeah. And then he wrote a book, uh, Stealing Fire. I forgot who else he wrote it with. And um, it's about just like peak states and, and all this stuff. And they, they refer a lot, of, a lot of stuff back to Google and and everything that they do to like spark creativity and innovation and all this stuff. And that, that and, and then in itself though, I mean, fuck, if they've really figured it out that well, they deserve to win. Yeah. Well, I think that you, you end up with these like positive feedback loops, right? Where you have an innovation in the market that starts to give you a bunch of like revenue and, and, and market share. And then based upon that, you have a bunch of resources that you can start to reinvest so you can hire better people. And then you start to see what the actual problems are that are coming up because you are the one who is sort of at the cutting edge of what's going on. So then you can innovate based upon that because you have capital and you have people. So you just get all these positive feedback loops going that just put you in a position to, to grow that quickly. Do you feel like that happens on small levels too? Yeah, of course. Like for us? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Um, I think that in the... Uh, whatever, like in, in the CrossFit market, so to speak, right? You certainly have gyms that are haves, quote unquote, and gyms that are have nots, right? And the gyms that are haves are able to utilize the fact that they have more people reaching out to better understand their customer. You know, they have people reaching out so they can actually um, like hire more coaches and then they can leverage the coaches that they have or like the owner's time better to do more stuff to reinvest in the facility. So you get, again, like the, the positive wheel spinning and that that, further separates the haves from the have-nots because right? the have-nots are struggling to, you know, make ends meet and can't reinvest in anything and don't have people reaching out. So they don't really know what's going on or like what their customers want or where they're potentially going wrong. Cause that's when someone doesn't sign up, you know, it's just like, well, why did that happen? Right. But if you have more people, you can say, Oh, like people aren't signing up because their class sizes are too big. All right. Like how do we fix that? That's true. That's awesome. So it's 2019. I want to ask you one of those silly questions, uh, not a resolution, but what's like right now, if you 
played this podcast a year from now, what's one thing that you would want to have or accomplish in your in your life? My life. Yeah. My life in 2019. Yeah, like what's like if you had to pick like one thing that was going to be like the theme. Yeah. What would it be? The theme. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Um, well, I think that uh, one thing I've been working on a lot that I've struggled with, um, and this is sort of like a like a business buzzword as far as like delegation, right? But I think I actually have a much better understanding now of what is reasonable to expect of people when you delegate to them and what is not, right? So giving people something that is a, a job that they can do that isn't something that I either just like abdicate to them and just sort of say, hey, like, here you go, like, go do this, good luck. Um, nor is it something that I pass off to them and then end up having to like either do it myself because I'm unhappy with how it's going or like micromanage them and kind of like step on their toes and be like, no, you gotta do it this way, you gotta do it this way, whatever. Um, so I think that that's um, a combination of being better at delegating tasks and projects coupled with uh, better understanding how to teach people stuff, I think is probably like the main thing that I'm concerned with. Uh, and people being like employees in this context, right? Because it's one thing to to teach a, a group of people who want to listen how to snap or how to snatch, right? It's one thing to teach, you know, if you're giving some sort of like lecture or talk on something where it's like, hey, I'm going to explain how I think this works, you know, that that's a totally different situation than trying to teach people uh, to perform potentially like complex, difficult tasks and to make decisions in a certain way that you would want them to make decisions. So that if... If I, can, if I can figure out how to do those 2019, that's a successful year. How would you know when you did it? Um, well, I think that there's, there's probably a variety of, uh, um, you know, things that, that if you can pass something on and someone else can do it as well as you or potentially better, um, then that's probably indicative of having some success with that. Right. So, I mean, if you take something simple like coaching, right, um, where, you know, coaching a group CrossFit class, there's a lot of, you know, sort of like basic checkbox things that need to happen, right? Like start it on time, control the logistics, um, explain the workout properly, make sure people understand the stimulus, spend a certain amount of time with each client, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, But, you know, can you be in a position where you're able to teach someone not just to do that, but also to make like the complex decision making required uh, when someone has like, a movement issue, right? Or um, is, you know, struggling with like hip impingement or uh, always has the same flaw when they snatch or has like a negative emotional reaction to being coached. You know, how do you actually handle all of these things that come up? And, um, you know, can, can you teach someone to be able to do that at a level that is as good as you, if not better? And then can that person potentially teach someone else to do it? that would probably be like a pretty good threshold for like, have you actually imparted that knowledge and have you learned how to, to teach that effectively? I got to tell you, I love how your brain thinks. Why? Not because it's, it is, um, it's a different direction than mine. And uh, I'm willing to bet that people probably get intimidated of that because it's probably not their their normal line of thinking at first, but it intrigues me to hear something that I wouldn't say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like what? Like what do you mean? So like how you just articulated the coaching in the class. I think me and you would get to the same place, but I would never say it that way. Yeah. And that's like, I think that that's so interesting about about me and you that we probably appreciate about each other, but at the same time, we're going to the same place, but the ways we get there is just really different. Yeah. And then, but we appreciate our difference versus being intimidated or insecure about it. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just thought, I was thinking about that when you said that, like, cause I was like, man, that's exactly how a class would work, but I would never say those word choices. I think that's interesting about you. And I wonder if while you're delegating, that happens to someone else in a non-successful way. Probably. So actually, tell th- this. This may be insightful. So you, you, I mean, you mentioned the word intimidation, um, and I think I do intimidate people, and I don't mean to at all. 
So what about that is intimidating? I know I... No, I'll say it. My knee-jerk reaction is, motherfucker, this guy is way smarter than me or thinks more than me. And then I sit back and go, wait a second. I'm not fucking dumb, right? But that's like my first thing. And then I go, we just think in different directions. And that's why his direction seems so vast compared to my direction. It's just because we'll go to B, but we'll take opposite ways to get there. So we just go around the globe in opposite directions. Pretty much. Yeah. And I think at first, that's my knee-jerk reaction. It's like, holy fuck, I can't even articulate that. I'd be like, show up on time, make sure people have fun, keep everyone safe. (laughs) Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Play some good music. Like, you know, and uh, and I, I think that that's, that's the thing. And yeah, knee-jerk reaction, it's intimidating. It's intimidating. Um, at first, I go, oh, my God. And then I think, man, if I say something, it better be really smart. And then, yeah, I mean, I could just imagine that. That's all honest. Yeah. But I think it takes people um, a good sense of yourself. To have that knee-jerk reaction and then be able to be okay with it and move on. I think a lot of people um, just aren't aren't cool with that. Cool with someone saying something different or saying something that they don't understand right away. Or like even asking, hey, what did you mean? You know, it's almost like, don't slam me for being stupid, but tell yeah. me what the fuck I need. I mean, I've been there. I mean, I've, I've had ego moments where like, that's gone the opposite way. Yeah. So I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. I, I don't know if I've really thought about that exact concept, right? Because, I mean, um, I, I, I know that I can have a tendency to kind of, like, dig deep or, like, overwhelm with, like, different details or concepts or paths or whatever, um, where it's like, well, here's all the different contingencies that you could potentially think of. Like, let's list them all out. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And then also if this happens, here's this, 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 and this. And, well, over here we have this, 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 and this, right? And that, that um, you know, I... I enjoy thinking in that way and sort of like seeing all those different paths and like the different things that could be happening or like, you know, in coaching all the different, I always use the, the analogy of like just like turning knobs up and down where it's like, you have a bunch of knobs you can be turning, like you got to pick the right one. Um, but I, I guess I never really considered that talking about that could make someone sort of react and be like, Oh no, I'm sort of on the spot to like also have to speak in that, in that level of complexity. Yeah, that's that's knee jerk. That's like like when you were saying that. That's like my knee jerk. Um, I don't think it's bad. I I appreciate it about our relationship. So I don't say that so you uh, change it. Yeah, I'd be disappointed if you did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting too. I'm sure for me, um, my intensity. So your intellect and my intensity are probably the things that make people nervous. But it's probably the things that we like about each other. Sure. And, and it's same aspect. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just very interesting. Do you feel like for you now, um, like as a coach, do you use more of that intellect or do you go more arts, not artsy, like more like at this point of your coaching, when you're working with someone like, like a, like a, a more developed athlete, I should yeah. say, do you, do you stay that way or do you go kind of off the rails because you're a musician too so i know you have that part of your yeah. brain uh, I, th- I think it depends probably on the person right if we're talking like coaching someone in fitness like one-on-one yeah um, i think i have probably a slightly uh more calibrated understanding of like how much complexity and detail people want in those contexts so if i'm talking to someone who i think wants details and is like curious about it and has done some research and potentially you know has um, ideas or books that they've read or whatever, that person I might like really lay down a flow chart on them and be like, all right, like here's what's going on. Like you think this, 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 and this, I know you read it here, 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 and here. What actually happens is this, 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 and this, you know, I'm just like, yeah. just go full, um, uh, like detail like that. Yeah. I actually did, I mean, I did that the other day with someone who was asking me questions about just like back pain. Right? And they're like, is my back weak? I'm like, well, hold on. All right, we're going to talk about this. Right? We're going to talk sure. about how, you know, breathing mechanics work and how, um, you know, weakness and strength isn't really the right way to think about it. Like you're thinking on the wrong layer of abstraction. You have to actually, you know, understand co-activation of different musculature and how um, with different positions of joints can cause like neurological tension and muscles can be short or long and feel tight and just like hammer 
Yeah. Right? But that person like wanted that. Yeah. That was helpful for them. Sure. Because for them, you know, they they have information and they want more, and they're trying to like make decisions based upon that information. If they're confused about it, then they're going to do the wrong thing because they're going to do whatever like their their flow chart says. Yeah. So I have to just kind of like overlay it with mine and be like, no, like erase yours. Here's mine. Do this. But for other people, they don't want it. So yeah. Then, then I, I, I say. Yeah, I, I learned to not do that when sure. I don't think it's appropriate. That's such a strength of yours that I don't think I've ever even thought of. That you, um, you have both gears very sound. I think people usually, um, you're either an engineer or you're an artist. You're very rarely both, you know. And I think that's interesting about you that you were able to. To live in both worlds and at different times. Do you favor one? Um, I don't know, actually. I mean, I think that probably – I probably do everything like in a, in a somewhat like methodical way. Yeah. Right? So there is probably that element of like organization and like task focus with almost everything I do. So if I am trying to create something, right, if I'm trying to write a song or um, you know, like write an article or something like that, I will allocate time for it. Like maybe even make it a fucking Asana task for it. Like, All right. Like here's my time to do this. Um, you know, I'll have like Evernote documents with ideas and all that kind of stuff. So I will be particular about it. Um, but as far as what I like doing, I probably like doing creative stuff more than I like doing non-creative stuff. If that makes sense. Sure. But I will be like a weird. But psycho. the structure gives you creativity. Oh, for sure. Yes. Okay. It's so interesting. It's so cool that like both of that works for you. Like you prepare and create the structure so you can play. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause if, if it, um, I, I don't know if things that are unstructured, like aren't, I, I, I don't know what the right word is for it. Um, I think that just almost everything I do, I turn into a structure. And so even being creative, I turn into a structured time. So, all right, here's how this works. Like, got my got my time allocated. I got my Evernote document with song ideas or something that I want to steal. All right, cool. We're gonna we're gonna play with that now. How often do you do that? Play with music? Um, I'm also, I mean, we have band practice once a week um, for like rats. So that I mean that kind of keeps me focused as far as like okay, I have like another practice that I have to come to and potentially because uh, we're finishing writing the record now. Right, so it's like, all right, wow. I have to come and I have to have something to work on. So that's definitely helpful as far as like making it more of a priority. How many of you guys write in the group? Um, so it's it's interesting, right? So um, in Like Rats, it's like predominantly my uh, like songs. Um, so I usually will come with stuff and be like, all right, here's how these risks go. Here's how this part goes. The transition goes like this, boom, boom, boom. Um, and then we'll kind of mess with it and practice, right? We'll play a few of the parts into each other. And then if something doesn't feel right, um, some of the other guys will have some ideas, all that kind of stuff. Um, so other people don't tend to come with like an idea or a song for the band, but based upon what I have, they will then uh, contribute stuff. And actually the new stuff has more contributions from the other uh, band members than the older stuff, which I think is good. I do. I like that. I think, um, I think if, you know, for a lot of people that are in bands, like if you look at like the Eagles, like why the Eagles stayed timeless is because they had Glenn Fry and Don Henley yeah. kicking it. Like, you know what I mean? But like one of them apart, I don't think would have been able to make um, like that band that great. You know what I mean? If there's only one or two people that do it. Let it be made known. I do not like the Eagles. You don't like the Eagles? <laughs> no, Dude, I like the Eagles. No joke. Let me be perfectly clear here. I'm saying this right now. Go I on. I think it was on show I think it was on Showtime. I think on Showtime there's like a three hour documentary. Watch the fucking Eagles. They're cool as fuck. I probably would watch that though. It really is very like I really like them after I watched that. You know, it's just um I didn't realize how talented each of them were in the group. Like, and that, as soon as I, like, that's when I started digging deeper, but there's a really good documentary about it. And I also too, um, there's something about songwriting to me that's always been, um, I've always been fascinated by it. Like the riff comes first or the, the words come first and like how these two things meet to make a perfect song, you know? And I love watching documentaries like that, where you know what these songs really mean to them and why they're there. And I think that that just creates something 
Yeah, just crazy. Do you do you write the riff or the words first? Uh, so I don't write any of the lyrics for okay. my rats. Yeah, so it's pretty much all the music is always first for music. That. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and to actually kind of elaborate on that because this is something that I I do think about and find interesting is um, um, like writing music sort of like top down or bottom up, right? So um, like bottom up would be you know just sort of like fiddling around and coming up with a riff or something like that, yep. and then trying to build around that. Uh, and top down would be more like I want something that sounds like this. You have this vision yep. for how the song is going to lay out or what it's going to sound like, but I don't necessarily have any of the parts. And I'll do both. Right? So sometimes I'll start at the top and see the whole thing and try to like put parts into it. And other times you're just like fiddling around. You're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. Maybe I should record that. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so interesting. I think that that is like one of the most, I think it's serendipitous moments, like when it all... When you see it, like, uh, what did I watch the other day? Jeff Beck. Yeah. So there was a documentary of, on him uh, on Showtime. And uh, so he's got very popular for his work with Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. And the drum intro to Superstition, he did messing around. And Stevie didn't even know it was him. Oh, Jeff Beck played that? Yeah. So he played the drum. And Stevie walks in. And he's like, that's amazing. Jeff's like, it's me. Yeah. And then he goes... And then they fit in that guitar riff that's like what makes the song, but based off that, but he just played the drum. That's fascinating. Did and he record that drum lick or did Stevie No, he played it? it. So he he was with Stevie yeah. and they were like on break and he goes in there and he plays the drum. Stevie walks in yeah, yeah. and then he showed the drummer and then he created his guitar riff and that's what made yeah. Superstitious. superstitious. Yeah. And I just think like, it's so crazy how it could, it's, it's so chaotic that it could go from any direction and when it's good, you know it's good. But when it's shit, you know it's shit. Yeah. And I think that that's like so crazy. It could start anywhere, but you know when you got it, when you got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you sort of have these ideas kind of like bubbling up and then they just pop out. And then then you have to evaluate it after the fact. It's kind of like, here it is. Is that any good? Yes or no? Yeah. And when, how long have you been writing or doing music? Uh, I mean, the first band that I was in probably started when I was 15 or 16. Right. So, I mean talking well over 15 years and how did you get into that um so my dad played guitar uh, he still plays guitar he was in like a cover band as a, a young man um, so there were always like guitars around the house and um, at some point I wanted to play and uh, my, my dad's guitar was so hard to play um, like the strings were um, super super thick the action on the guitar was super high so for listeners who may not know what that means it's like how hard it is to push down on the strings the the answer for that guitar was very hard <laughs> um and they're like they just hurt like when you start playing guitar your fingers just hurt and it's part of it but this thing was impossible um and at some point i guess i was serious enough that they got me uh like a smaller guitar um that was easier to play and then based upon that i just started um fiddling with it and my dad taught me at least the basics, uh, but a lot of it was just listening to records that I liked and figuring out how to play the songs. All right, how's that part go? So you've had no formal? Not really. I, I've taken a few random lessons here and there, um, but yeah, I mean, it was mostly like self-taught from uh, like listening to stuff that I liked and learning how to play it or, um, you know, just playing with friends. And I actually think that that was, um, at one point I think I was like, Lessons are stupid, whatever. I just like learned on my own. But I don't think that was actually like a good thing necessarily. Like I had a lot of weird bad habits. The way I held the pick was all messed up. And if I had like a guitar teacher, they would be like, yo, dude, don't do that. Like, do sure. it the right way. What's wrong with you? Um, and, you know, so I've had to relearn some things. And uh, um, I did have, I was in band. So I, you know, played clarinet and saxophone in band. Um, but I mean, it's, you know, almost like two separate worlds as far as like music is concerned. Yeah. Um, but I, I do kind of wish that I had more formal training with guitar because there's probably a lot of stuff that would be valuable to have learned. And also would have just like dramatically shortened the, the process of like figuring out how to do things too. Sure. Do you still play the horns at all or do you just no. play guitar? Yeah. It's too bad. No, I just, I man, I was like, man, you play the piano a little bit, play the guitar, and now the horns, you got it all coming out. Tweedledee. That's it, man. That's, is there, do you use music as adult play? Um, 
What do you mean by adult? Like, I mean, like, I feel like... Adult videos? No, not adult (laughs) videos. I mean, like, um... Like when, you know, we were kids, we would just draw or we would just color. And then as adults, we really don't do that. Is that your, um, is that your form of just like playing? And to me, what playing is, is doing something without expectation from like in a transactional sense. Sure. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I necessarily have whatever expectation of like a, a, a some sort of transaction, but I, I play is probably something that I'm not great with as discussed previously, right? That yeah. like everything kind of becomes like systematic. Um, but I, I certainly think of music almost as like a, uh, it's almost like a separate world that you can fiddle with, right? So it's not necessarily, you know, a lot of people like music because of like the emotion associated with it, whatever. Like I don't fucking care about that at all, right? Like it, to me, it's like, oh, here's, these sort of building blocks that you can mess around with to like create something that is just sort of inherently interesting for its own sake. So that's kind of how I think about it. So um, I don't know if that counts as play really. Sure. So let me ask you this. Have you always had this sort of um, systematic structured brain? Probably. Like as far as like you could remember, this is how you rolled? Yeah, I think so. Um, so interesting. And I, and I, and well, what I think is interesting is for me, at some point realizing that other people weren't like that. You know what I mean? And, uh, cause I, I I certainly knew that people didn't behave that way, but I think I just thought that they were like lazy or wrong. Sure. And then at some point being like, Oh wait, I'm the one who's weird. Okay, cool. Uh, Yeah. You know what? I think what was like that. Um, I think Elon Musk podcast with Joe Rogan, he mentioned something like that. Yeah. Like at first he thought everyone thought like him. Yeah. And then, like, he was, like, blown away when it wasn't that way. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think when you're a youth and you, for some reason, you get it, like, that young, I think that's how you have to look at it. You, yeah, can't, well, think, you can't think it's different. Yeah. It, you know, you, at least for me, I certainly ended up with, like, some, um, I don't know, just, like, general teen angst and confusion surrounding that, right? Because you're like, oh, well, I think the world is like this, but no one else behaves this way. And, you know people are doing all this stuff that doesn't make any sense and they say one thing and they do another and none of it is actually like helping them accomplish anything that they should accomplish. Like what's going on here? I don't get it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know at what point I started to understand that, you know, I was the one who was the, the weirdo based upon that. But certainly at some point I was like, Oh, that's, I do this, but no one else does. Okay, cool. Got it. Yeah. It's so interesting. Um, how do you, because you're in, you're in a committed relationship, did you just let that play out and she found that out? Or is that something you um, st- went out and stated? You mean like on the first date? Like, just so you know. <laughs> just so you know, um, I've been planning this dinner. Uh, at 6.47, we're going to get, uh, you know, yeah. like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Is, that, is that something that came out naturally or is that something that you at your mature age or more mature age, we're able to like really articulate in, in a way that presented it probably better than when you were a kid that you were probably just like, fuck you, you're weird. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Honestly. I mean, looking back on, um, you know, I mean, a few years ago, um, I, I would be, I would be probably a little bit remiss to be like, Oh, well, this is exactly what happened. But I mean, I certainly think that, um, uh, probably a combination of a few things, right? I mean, one is like, sort of learning the the standard veneer of social graces sure. at some point, right? Sure. Where, you know, um, at some point it was like, oh, okay, here's how you do it. You know, here's how you, like, have small talk and don't just overwhelm people with, you know, some ideas from some book. Right. And they're like, yeah, like, I want to talk about, like, my theory on this. And people are like, why are you doing that? Huh. So, you know, I, I think some of it was, was certainly that. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, get, get, as you get started with any relationship, um, especially as you mature and you sort of learn about yourself, I definitely, uh, you know, became aware of like, hey, listen, you know, just so you know, I'm like not so good with certain types of things. Like I can be very, um, like seem like cold and distant, but I'm not necessarily actually like that. I just don't, you know, respond to emotions in the same way as other people do. Or, um, you know, sometimes I can come across as harsh, but like, I don't always mean it. I just am like concerned with doing things right, you know, et cetera. So 
Um, I think that some of those things were probably discussed actively and some of them probably just came out, you know, based upon, I mean, like Teresa has hilarious stories of like our text message conversations, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, where she's trying to engage in some sort of like normal flirting type of situation. And I'm just like, <laughs> not <laughs> shut down, not, not, not participating in the way that I should have been. <laughs> <laughs> Poor girl. Do you feel like um, <laughs> out of the the wide uh, array, array of, of emotions, there's one in particular that you you struggle with the most right now? Uh, struggle with in terms of like that causes me emotional problems. I don't know about causing you emotional problems, but here here's a good example. Okay, so for me, um, the biggest emotion that I'm wrapping my head around is compassion right now. So you want to be more compassionate, but are having a hard time with it. Yeah, not that I'm having a hard time with it, but like I've never even wanted to appreciate it, I think, in the, in the true context of the word, sure. especially with myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so like when I say like the emotion, that that's something that I'm like almost a little tone deaf to at times. And I'm trying to work so you, on being... So you're tone deaf to compassion, like someone being compassionate towards you or... More me being compassionate to me, but then okay. also that has led me down in moments where I don't give a fuck about your excuse. Mm -hmm. But in reality, that's like someone's story. And so like I've, I've played that card a bunch of times. So that's like something right now that I'm working on is this idea of compassion and what it looks like um, to let yourself and others off the hook. And that was a concept that I never had. And so is there something like that for you? Probably the exact same thing. Right, because I think that um, for me, I'm just so easily frustrated all the time, um, and I have a hard time not being frustrated with things that I think are like stupid or lazy or um, inconsistent or hypocritical or whatever. Um, and I think there's certainly some value in that sometimes, right? To have a little bit of like an, an edge and like an intolerance for things that you don't think are good enough, right? That that's yep. potentially positive, uh, but I certainly don't think that it's always helpful to be like that either. So. Um, you know, if maybe some combination of like compassion and or empathy to be able to, like you said, sort of understand, you know what, like, this is why this is happening. And, you know, uh, here's where this person is actually at and here's what they're thinking. And this is why they didn't do what you wanted. And if you do it this way, or if you approach them this way instead, they will, you know, that would be probably beneficial. Yeah. You could use some of that. I do. I, I, I struggle with the idea of compassion and letting people out was the difference between compassion at times and just letting people off the hook, you know? Oh, so for you, it's more like you're on, if I, if I'm not whatever director or firm or whatever with you, then you're off the hook. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I don't really have that experience. Um, but I think that I, uh, um, I'm not necessarily great. Like with, with, I mean with stupid stuff where it's like having to check on something with someone, it just drives me crazy. Yeah. It's like, you said you were going to do this. It's not done. What's going on? Like, and, and, and not being whatever compassion in that situation. I think it's causes me more stress than it's worth. Cause it's not something that's worth getting upset over. Yep. Um, and then, um, you know, I can either be overly firm with someone or like not follow up with them because I'm mad. And like, neither of those are out. Yep. So. It's so interesting. You know, it's just, um, it's like, what'll matter in five years? And at the same time, you got to take care of what's happening in front of you simultaneously. Yeah. Being a human is not easy. No, we made it, <laughs> we made it really hard on ourselves. I think that's, I think that's the best way to say it. I think at one time this shit was really simple. We just eat, slept and fucked. And now we got oh, all man, we had, we had all kinds of like tribal relations we that is true them, yeah there are all these coalitions forming all the time mm -hmm. people were getting ostracized someone was trying to take over power it's complicated it's just incredible do you um do you study a lot of history probably not i think it's interesting yeah it's something that on my list of priorities is probably not at the top and if i had unlimited capacity i'd be like yeah this is awesome but um i don't i don't do too much like reading that kind of stuff do you 
I wouldn't say I would probably I'm more fit to watch a documentary. Yeah. Like I really enjoy that. You know, I think um there's certain things that um visually I, I could take in, but like if somebody's like a story and painting a picture, I see it better sometimes than just reading um, historical facts or the way it was. For me, like to see it that way is is just a little bit better for me. Yeah, there's like you, like we said before, like certain things like on Audible are great. Like you know what I mean? Like certain things work certain ways. I love the documentaries of it mm -hmm. by far. So like Gladiator. Not just, like, no, like, yeah, 300, you know. Um, no, like, you know, just when they're really, like, talking about, for me, the the biggest fascination would be, like, um, Roman Empire stuff. I just think it's so interesting that... Because um, you're Italian? Partly. Yeah. Um, but also, too, um, so much has not changed. And, like, when you really think about us as, like, people, like, what happened the instances, even like certain tech, certain pieces of technology are just the same. And to me, that's so, as far as we've gone, it's as far as we've not gone. It's just so interesting to me. And I think like how amazing that 2000 years ago, some guy was sitting there fucking thinking of certain things like this and how they could really work without a quarter of the tools we have. And then like, we have so many fucking tools and people still don't do amazing shit. Yeah. It's like, to me, that, like, that's like a huge, crazy paradigm to think about. Like, or do we have so much that we're spoiled and now we don't do cool shit? I mean, I think that's probably the, you know, the, the human condition has probably been basically the same for most of our existence. So just like us being anxious as hell about our social status the entire time and like constantly freaking out. and Sure. Um, but making ever increasingly crazy technology throughout that whole process. In hopes of almost like coping with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like to think about that. That's what we did. We're just like, we're fucked up. How can we make ourselves not feel fucked up right now? Yeah. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a phone. I'm going to call somebody. <laughs> I'm going to talk to somebody so I don't have to talk to myself. So really, it's, it's just incredible. Like what's been happening. Yeah, but I like a, a little bit of that. You know what I think is, um, I forgot what I read once. It's just good to have things that you're curious about. Because if they're not directly correlated into your work, they could spark a lot of like creativity in other areas. Yeah. And so, you know, you could go watch a chef cook a meal and that could, you know, equal something else in a whole other area for you. And I just think taking in information in that way of something that's artistic and great or maybe historic, it just you could just learn it and apply it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I, I, I definitely do a lot of stuff like that of trying to whatever, read and experience things outside of like my normal field, so to speak. Um, I also think that, I mean, this is probably like slightly arrogant, but I mean, you're probably in a somewhat similar situation where it's like, dude, I don't need to go to another seminar on writing training programs for people. You know, the, 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 there's diminishing returns on that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, not that I couldn't be better at it, but that, you know, the, the learning from that doesn't necessarily come from, like, studying the field that you're in all the time. The, like you said, insights can come from other areas or, like, ancillary fields and all that kind of stuff. I agree. You know what it is, too? It's like, um, I think so many times um, in this oversaturation of information age that we've just become obsessed with getting information. Yeah. And, like, not doing much with it. Like, if you really think about, like... Like from a program design perspective, we could probably find talk about three to five books that's basically just read these books and then go do it for 10 years and you'll get an idea of what the fuck's happening. Yeah. I mean, like that's, and I think some, um, it's almost like people have, some people have such a innate insecurity about them that they're never ready to like get off the tit. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, that's, that's how I feel like for me, for, for programming now, it's like I look at certain things I, and I still study it, but it's de definitely been more of, of just trial and error that has shaped it in the last four years. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I think you're right in that a lot of, a lot of people have, um, you know, they, they think that they're going to finally learn something that's going to sort of push them off the edge into being able to do the thing that they want to do, whether that's program design or like start a business or whatever. Um, and that you know, past a certain point, the most valuable thing you can do is have real life experience. 
right? And then if you're also learning in conjunction with that, then you get to bounce those two things off of each other. It's like, okay, I learned this concept, now I can try it in real life. Did it work? Yes or no. But when people are just endlessly consuming information, they don't have reference experiences to work with. It's just like... Jeopardy. Just, yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing's happening. Yeah. What would you say inspires you to, to keep growing? Um, I don't even think of it that way. Like, I think it's just like, I ha I've always had uh, a desire to learn and take in information and like try it and see what happens and create stuff. And it's not like inspiration is irrelevant. It's like, this is just a weird behavior pattern <laughs> that like you can trace back a long time. Sure. Right. Of like, all right, you know, I'm going to, start reading all these books that were referenced in this band's album that I like, and I'm going to listen to every band that they thanked in their thanks list. And, um, oh, okay, this, you know, philosophy book referenced this philosophy book. I'll read this one. It's just always been kind of like a, a desire to, like, collect information and, like, trace the roots of things, but then simultaneously to create stuff too, right? So, I mean, you know, starting bands in high school and, like, making... Uh, like weird political magazines that we distributed throughout our high school and all that kind of stuff. It's just like always been a thing. And um, I don't even think that inspiration is part of it. It's just like a, it's like a weird behavior pattern. It's like, yeah. all right, this is what we do. You know what's so crazy is, um, not crazy, but just something that, that I thought of when you were saying that is like, and, and almost reference to what we said earlier is, so I'm, very much about inspiration. Yeah. So I get inspired to peel back layers and you peel back layers and, and you could add, you could add this. So I get inspired to peel back layers of learning new things and going deeper and stuff like that. And for you, why do you think you do it? Is it just something you do? Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, I, I guess if you sort of break it down like that, I probably, what I probably like doing is making like mental models of things and seeing, if they work and trying to like add to them, right? So by peeling back layers, you're just like, oh, okay, well, what's going on here? What, why is that like that? Oh, that didn't work. Like, why did, you know, this person say to program this exercise and you would improve this? It didn't happen. What's going on? Like, you know, oh, this band ripped off this band. Well, where did they get it from? Like, why that? You know, it's just that, that there's an element of like curiosity and like enjoyment of trying to make those connections um, that I think drives the behavior. And whether I'm inspired or not, like, I just do that. I like that. A lot of times I'm not inspired to do that type of thing, right? It's like, at some point I found something interesting and put it on a list of stuff that I need to look at. And then I just make time and look at it. So interesting. How your brain, <laughs> or no, I think it's, I think it's really fascinating. And I, and, and if any, you know, if anyone's listening, I think the, the one thing, um, that I hope people understand is um, at the end of this, me and you are going to the same place, right? You, you call it uncovering. I call it inspired. Like it's all. And, and I think that's the key for people to just get is um, you're going, you, you may be going a certain place. Don't be, don't be mad or unhappy with your method. You know, what I mean? like, cause if you, if I try to do how you do it and you try to do how I do it, we'd be fucking miserable. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of times, I think people look at people that may be, um, quote unquote, like successful or, uh, at a higher hierarchy than them, or even how they do things. And it's not the same as like these other people. And then they think their way sucks, which is fucking false. Yeah, there, there's probably, I mean, like you were saying before about a balance between stuff where, you know, understanding like why people do certain things in a certain way can be helpful. And sometimes people are just like completely on the wrong track. So if you're not aware of where you're going and what other people are doing, you might just be spinning your wheels, so to speak. Um, but that, that doesn't mean just like mimic exactly what someone else is doing either. Because you also don't know why that person is doing that. And I mean, you see that all the time in marketing and stuff too, where someone just like copies someone else's marketing campaign. It's like, you don't have the same product or the same like market that you're in. Don't do that. Why are you doing it? Yeah. That's something too fucking marketing. Like, um, especially in our industry. Uh, 
I go back and forth, and I'd love your uh, opinion on this. So, you know, there's kind of like cheesy marketing, and then there's what you would call good marketing is like just putting out a good product, putting out information about that. And I've seen businesses where in their foundation of their service and product is good. And they say that they use like sort of the cheesy marketing just to get people's attention. And then they give them like the good stuff. And um, personally for me, I can't do that. Like I can't. You can't be a cheese man? No, I can't a pretend. Cheeseman? I can't do it. Like I think it's like for some reason in like my heart, it's like being out of integrity. And, um, and I just wanted your thoughts on it. Cause like in this fitness game, if you're a better marketer, you fucking win. Yeah. It really, yeah. Clients can't differentiate. They don't know the difference. Yeah. I guess. Um, well, I mean, I think that, you know, if you're, if you're talking about the difference between giving people what they want versus what they need, that, um, the, the line as far as trade off there is different for everyone. Right. People have totally different areas where they're comfortable saying, okay, this is what you need and this is what I really think you should be having um, as far as like a program or, you know, coaching or exercise selection or whatever. But what you want is this, what you want is six pack abs or whatever, right? And it's like, okay, where on that spectrum are you comfortable sort of drawing the line as to what you'll give someone that is what they want, but not necessarily what they need. Um, but I think that basically, I mean, and, and I think everyone who's in business at some level is making that trade off, right? Especially in the area where you are like a quote unquote expert, you know, your level of knowledge surrounding the type of thing that the people need to be doing is going to be totally different than like the problem the client is trying to solve, right? Like, cause clients are going to come to you because they want to solve a problem. And if you don't speak to them in terms of the problem that they're trying to solve, they're just not going to come to you. Um, but to your point, though, about like cheesiness, I think that there's different levels there because I think that you can be authentic but still speak to clients in terms of like trying to actually solve their problems. Um, you know, I mean, for uh, to use like our industry as an example, as far as like growing across a gym, um, you know, I think I think it's totally authentic to speak about, you know, listen, you um, may feel like you have plateaued in your fitness and you're looking for something more and you like to challenge yourself and you maybe had a background playing sports growing up or do particularly well at like an intellectually demanding job. So you thrive on like long-term progression and goals that are difficult to reach and you're missing something as far as like what your physical fitness program is providing for you. Um, if you want to do something challenging and difficult that will be fulfilling for you and may potentially, you know, make you look good and live longer in the process, here's the thing, right? And like, that's authentic. And that potentially speaks to a problem that a client may be trying to solve. Um, but I think that when you're talking about cheesiness, a lot of that, the, the um, issues I have that with that stuff is I think a lot of it caters to people who are desperate, right? So it's like six weeks to a new you or whatever, like that's not appealing to someone's like higher order, like goals or whatever. Right. It's like you hate yourself and you're desperate, which that's not necessarily the client who I would want to serve. You know, and I don't necessarily think there's a problem with serving that client either, right? That those people do need something and some percentage of them may actually decide to continue on with a, you know, a more whatever long-term focused program. But a lot of people are desperate and a lot of people want like a fast track shortcut. And if you um, don't want to offer those things, then you just have to offer a, a solution to a problem that clients know that they have but doesn't necessarily cater to that demographic that again is like desperate or trying to fast track. Yeah. Cause yeah, I have, I, if there was anything that I would have a problem with it, shit like that, like, you know what it is too. It's like, I look at it as people preying on weak people. Yeah. And that's where I, which get, I think it can be. Sure. That's where I get probably, you know what it is? It's like, um, I look at, fitness and, and CrossFit and all this stuff in such a pure sense that when it's not done that way, I get, I get mad. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I, I, I get upset, you know, and, and just, um, from just an integrity perspective, I just, I would, I would, I, I couldn't do that. And I see a lot of people in our industry do that. And it's just, um, I get it why they do it. Cause they just want to make fucking money. 
but what expense? Or, or, or even, you know, you're in a situation where your business is not doing particularly well and you have no real game plan or path to move forward. And then you realize that like, oh, there's this, there's this significant portion of the population that will just actually pay me money so I can operate my gym if I offer them this thing. Okay, great. Like, let's do it. You know, you were talking earlier about um, Zuckerberg and Facebook, right? Where, you know, if, if you find something that works and you think you're on like a higher order mission, then it's relatively easy to justify the fact that you're doing something to make money to support like the, the mission that you're on. And again, I think everyone is doing that at some point. You know? I mean, it is, is the programming for the group classes at South Loop Strength and Conditioning 100% like best practices for all the individuals in the class? Absolutely not, right? But if it was, the number of complaints and cancellations that we would get would just be like, you know, we wouldn't have a business. Right. So, okay, how comfortable am I with giving people, you know, more like fun, quote unquote, conditioning than they should be doing? And, you know, there's a line somewhere for me, but I'm certainly willing to make that trade off a little bit so that people actually come and show up. It's no doubt. That's, that's the thing. Um, if people found out <laughs> what good fitness for them look like they would hate exercise yeah. <laughs> yeah that's the best way to say it like yeah. you know what i mean like the only way you would breathe heavy is on an assault bike or rower like i mean like you your life would be pretty boring yeah it's like guess what <laughs> dumbbell rows and walking lunges again <laughs> here we go yeah. side planks side yeah. planks all around let's yeah. do this <laughs> it's like seriously that would be like the fucking prescription <laughs> which is like what the fuck yeah <laughs> It really, I mean, shit. It's it's so crazy to even say, but I mean, that's what's that like. So I've been I've been thinking about this, and I'm gonna put this out there, and I want to figure this out. So I am thinking about, and I think it has to be in the summer for it to work out well. But taking a 30 day break from organized fitness, and um, the biggest reason I, and the only thing I, the reason I say in the summer is because I want to allow myself to like play, like ride a bike and like do things physical. I'm not going to be completely um, against that, but just this idea of organized fitness. Um, I feel like, so oh, Saturday, it'll be 10 years I've done CrossFit. And, uh, and I was thinking about why I started CrossFit and what that relationship was and what it is, what would I like it to be now? And I think I even fall in this trap of an unhealthy exercise uh, habit with a relationship with exercise where like if I eat pizza tomorrow morning, I have to go work out like yeah. it's I have to so like pay off your debt or whatever. Right. Or um, I worked out all week. So Saturday night I get to eat shit like whatever, whatever paradigm there is, you know, and um, I want to look at exercise in a place where like it's a healthy relationship. Like think about this, like if if you told me you had a hard day and then you, uh, in order, order for you to deal with that de-stress from that hard day, you went and shot heroin, I'd be like, you're an asshole. Yeah. You're terrible. But if you were like, yeah, I went to the gym, I did an hour long class and I did 40 minutes of assistance work because that class wasn't enough. Feel great now. I'd be like, oh, you're just really healthy. And I think yeah. that's like the thing that I want to just understand about me. And, 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 and also too, it's helping me understand more about people and their relationship with all this. Cause it, it, people have, a, there's a crazy brain to it. And so I'm like, yeah. I'll give it up for 30 days and I want to see, um, where my relationship is. Is this a celebration of what I could do physically or is this a punishment? Yeah. yeah there's, for a lot of people, it's like weird and dark. It's like, I hate myself a lot and this is a way I can punish the bad person who I am. And right. Oh, like, that's kind of weird. For real. Please don't use my facility to act out your weird self-hatred fantasies. No, it's true. Like when you think about it too, like a lot of people who gotten in CrossFit are ex-addicts. Yeah. But they're really not ex-addicts. They're addicts of CrossFit. Yeah. So it's not like you've beat your addiction. It's no, you've masked it with one that's better than you drinking. Sure. Or more sociably accessible than you drinking and driving your car. And it's like, it's so many people are like that. Yeah. And, and that's what I think, I think CrossFit in a way, um, not in a bad way, it's just, it's just a byproduct of CrossFit, almost like sort of like that Facebook shit. It's like, it is perfect for people that are addictive. It is like an addictive person's dream. Yeah. You get more, you get harder, you get it measured. 
Like it's just perfect. And uh, so I've been just really thinking about that. Like is for me as like someone that exercises and someone that has had a um, lost weight and a, re- a certain relationship with exercise and definitely a certain relationship with food. What would that look like if I would I go eat two two hamburgers if I didn't think I could go work out tomorrow? Like what would that change in me? And that's what I want. I want to find out. Yeah, that's cute. That, that... Because the other aspect to that too is that for a lot of people, exercise is like the habit on which their other healthy habits rest, right? So if they don't exercise, their sleep and their diet and their stress management and everything else just goes out the window. But if they're in the gym, then they have guilt because they're like, well, I just trained, so I like shouldn't do whatever. Yep. So that's it's so interesting you said that because that is true. Like when people work out, I'm back on it and everything's on or everything's off. Yeah. Like I have people that took off for a week for the holidays and everything falls off Yeah, and then everything's back on. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just so crazy to, you know, for me to just try to put myself in positions where I just get more understanding of me. Cause I think the more understanding of me, I have the more understanding I have of everyone in some capacity. Cause then it just helps you be more objective, helps you understand what someone may or may not be going through. And also too, for us as teachers, like our job is just to be, a minimum, but definitely at least one step ahead of the people we're working with. And I would just want to just try to keep making sure that I'm one step ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that, that would give you more perspective on different relationships to fitness, right? Rather than just like, all right, here's my program and I follow it. Yeah. Cause that's not the reality for a lot of people. That's not how they do it. No doubt. It's, it represents so much more. And I, I, I think what's crazy is, um, it's almost people are tone deaf to to that more. Like they don't really get it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's what I've been thinking about. 30 days of no formal exercise. And I don't think I've taken more than like maybe a week, maybe mm-hmm. seven, seven to 10 days in 10 years. Yeah. Like honestly. There we go. You got the, uh, the unswole 30. Oh my God. Look, <laughs> could you just imagine me? <laughs> like 190, 180 pounds just like walking around like a stick figure. No, I'd have to like... You're going to turn into a twink. That's it. Just my legs get all frail. No, but I just think it's, you know, for me, (laughs) my little frail body, I look like the machinist. Um, What do you do or do you even think about it? Because, I mean, obviously the way I filter things in you, it's different. Do you do things to put you in... um, in uncomfortable situations to learn about yourself? I think probably, but I don't know if I do that um, as deliberately as I used to. I think I used to value that more. I'd be like, I'm going to see how I react to this situation. Right? I mean, yeah. like you mentioned, like you're fasting right now. Yep. Right? So Angelo is at the, the tail end of a three-day fast. I'm actually there. Technically at this moment right now, I am 72 hours. There we go. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that for you is like, I'm just going to see if I can do this. And I think I used to do more stuff like that to just see if I could do it or to test myself or, um, uh, you know, try to learn about like how I'd react in like a stressful situation. Um, but I honestly don't feel like I've had that thought process in a long time. And there may be value in trying to um, understand what would be a situation that I would learn about myself. In, right. Um, Cause I think it's too easy for me to get caught up in uh, like tasks and doing things. As opposed to being like, okay, what's a situation in which I would learn about either myself or uh, learn about others through what I'm going through? Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, I think that this, something I've, I've been thinking about a lot is related to uh, sort of that concept with like socializing, right? I don't tend to value it. I don't tend to prioritize it. But when I do it, I enjoy it. And I think that it's important, right? So, okay, how do I recognize that this is something that's important and create time for it? Right, like uh, like travel. You know, I don't love traveling, but people are like, I love traveling. I don't. I don't. <laughs> no, I don't care. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, there there is a lot of value in being somewhere different and like being away from your daily routine and potentially having to figure stuff out and like learn about a new place or a new culture or whatever. So okay, how do I actually create time um, and prioritize that, even though it's not something I like want to do? So I probably do think about it in those terms. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, for me, it's like, um, it's a way to like build confidence 
and, and almost create a safe place to fail. These little like challenges. Like if I yeah. ate a fucking Twinkie this morning, I mean like nobody gives a shit. Yeah. And like. Dude, there is a Twinkie wrapper over here. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. No way. <laughs> um, no, but just like thinking about that, like almost in a way where you create this place where you can just experience things. And, and for me, like in, in just like a really safe way. You know, where it's not just completely falling off the rails. Maybe that's where it comes from. Part yeah, so you like sort of sandbox these little challenges. Yeah, I put myself in these in these in these situations where like if I pass it, great, I, I will learn something and it is an achievement, but if I don't at the same time, it doesn't define me and doesn't really affect other people at the same time. Yeah. Well, I think for me I also really like the process of kind of not being good at something and having to figure it out. I think a lot of people don't like that. Um, so it's almost like I inherently enjoy that. So would it be challenging for me to not do that? Would that be like a good challenge to not be trying to work on improving something or like developing a new skill? No. I mean, Perfect. if you, I think that's how you test yourself. Like the same way, like I don't eat for three days. It's like you go try to learn something as a way to test your, whatever, your cognitive abilities, your creativity. That could be like your way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think I just do that all the time. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to learn, you know, how to like write this type of computer code. Or I'm going to learn how to, um, how like energy metabolism works or well, like a physics book. Sure. So that's it. So interesting. But but I feel like I, I like that so much that there may be value in purposely not doing that. Could be. Like just, you know, subtraction no. and seeing what happens. Yeah. Absolutely. So for you right now, if you had to close your eyes and think of how you wanted your life in a decade from now, can you do that? Do I have to close my eyes? No, you don't, you don't have to get there. <laughs> no, but I mean, just like, are you... Is there anything that deeply rooted in you right now in your life that you feel like you could even conceive or even know that that's where you'll want to be or sure. be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I feel like a decade is such a long time that um, being like specific with the actual, um, you know, what I'm doing is probably not, um, won't be accurate, right? Because I mean, you know, if you look back 10 years, Similar to you, I started I started doing CrossFit right around ten years ago, right like a little over. So you know, at that point, did I have any conception that that would be like my profession? Absolutely not. You know, um, so I think that you know the the details of what I will be doing are like who who knows, right? Um, but I think that for me, I was sort of like we talked about the things that I really find valuable are a lot of um, you know taking in information and trying to like create models of how the world works and then like impart them upon people, you know, where I'm like, listen, I figured this out. Like, here's how it works. You should know this too. Um, but you know, be more tactical about sure. that. Um, so I think that that, that, that would probably be a, a key aspect of what I would be doing. Um, regardless of what that actually looks like from like a, a day to day perspective. That's awesome. I love thinking about that stuff because you're right. You can't think of the house. Yeah. Like it's only the where's yeah. or maybe what's, but like you can't like the, the minor details aren't there. And that's almost exciting for me to think about. Sure. You know, it's just interesting stuff. I mean, you made a vision board. I do. Is five that... years. Five years. Oh, that's five years. That's not five years. 2024. Yeah, that's my, that's my little life. But I, the biggest thing for me is um, I think so much of my youth was wrapped around like, what are you going to be when you grow up? Or what are you going to do? Are you going to be successful? Like, you know, like that kind of thing. Like whenever I make goals now, um, I don't do anything that has to do with work. Yeah. Unless it's like how I feel about my work. But if it's like, the gym or but i i can't i try not to like big picture try not to play in that world 
Because mm-hmm. to me, it, it almost contains me. Sure. Like you just said what you said. This could apply to a million things, and that leaves you open to them all. Versus this is where I'm going to be in this and that kind of shit. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like those more like tangible goals on smaller scales. I don't like them on big picture, personally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like doing like quarterly objectives and key results for the gym, I think is super valuable. No doubt. Right? We're like, okay, we want, you know, whatever, this much revenue this quarter. We want at least one or two coaches making this much per year. We want this improvement in conversion rate. Like, yeah, for sure. Like, awesome. Let's do that in three month in- increments. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't like shooting that out too far. Yeah. So I think that it's, um, it doesn't give you enough leeway to, to iterate and figure out what you should actually be doing. Well, you said you don't like to travel. Can you see yourself living here? Yeah. Yeah, I have no major problems with Chicago. I like it here. I do too. stuff that I do here. I do too. <laughs> we do have a cool city to live. Very cool. So let me ask you a question. I let every guest do this, so you get a chance. <laughs> you get to define Alpha Hippie. And it's kind of funny, too, because you had me on your show. Did I even have the podcast yet? You were, like, talking about maybe doing it. Yeah. Like, this was, like, when it was just, like, a T-shirt idea. Yeah. And so, yeah. So you get to define it. Yeah. Well, so I think that did, – did we talk about the story when I, I interviewed you? Um, so this is the, I feel like this is the definition of uh, alpha hippie, which was um, <laughs> Angelo and I were at the concert games and like walking through the crowd, and Angelo um, <laughs> is a very large like stoic looking person with like arms kind of like folded across his body, sort of like looking around, you know, like with like a slight smile on his face. Um, it's some man, some, some guy's like, he sees Angelo, he's like, hey man, I like your chest. Because <laughs> Angelo has a oh my God. huge upper body. And uh, um, it was kind of unclear if this was like a, like a, like if he was ridiculing you or was just kind of wasted and was like stoked on how big you were. And was like, dude, I also want to be big. Yeah. And, um, you know, you just kind of looked at him and you just were like, Thank you, my man. I don't even know what to say yeah. there. <laughs> so I would say that that right there is the definition of the alpha hippie. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I have to say this. You know, uh, the games now, I feel like people get way less drunk. Yeah, I wonder if that's related to the change in venue. What do you think? Because I remember it, fucking California. People, I mean, I've been there multiple years. People get fucking people used to like get blacked out, wasted. Yeah, just like blacked out, like rolling around. The, yeah. Maybe it's because they have to move more. Because remember how like before we'd go there and like you were in the soccer stadium all day. Yeah. And then you went to the tennis stadium and that was your day. I think like now people are moving more. So I think they yeah. don't get like stuck. Right. And the, Col- the Coliseum doesn't feel like a spot where you should be like so drunk you can't walk. Well, no, I, yeah, because like that felt like everyone was drunk there. Yeah. But compared to this one, no. Yeah. I wonder if that's something consciously they worked on. Yeah, I don't know. Or I don't know how that worked. Because I don't think people are drinking less. Yeah, I don't know. But I, I definitely see less. Like, you saw loud drunks. Yeah, a- anecdotally, I agree with you in that there were large groups of people who were very clearly blacked the fuck out at 2 p.m. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. And I don't believe I saw that. No way. And if they were, it was they weren't as loud. Yeah. Definitely nice. But I do. I think it's because people are moving around more. They, they don't get like just with a group and get shit faced. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So where can people find Todd Knife? Neff. <laughs> <laughs> Neff. Um, yeah. So the, the stuff I do on the web has three homes. Uh, so the gym, South Loop Strength and Conditioning in Chicago is southloopsc.com. Uh, online coaching is with Legion. Uh, that's legionsc.com. And then my own podcast featuring Angelo Sitsko approximately one year ago is at toddneef.com, uh, T-O-D-D-N-I-E-F dot C-O-M. And it, actually, if you spell it wrong, I did register a few of the incorrect spellings as well. 
so you never redirect it. <laughs> of course you would. You're like, oh, God, somebody's going to fuck this up. Yeah, I before exactly. he fucked this. Yeah. <laughs> Just exactly. change that. Exactly. That's awesome. All right, last question. If you had one word to be remembered by, oh, man. what would it be? I feel like I listened to some of your podcasts to make sure I was prepared for these questions. I never tell anybody, but I hope that people just figure it out. Yeah, and I just like didn't actually prepare for this question. It's good. I think it's best when, when it just it's first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah. Um, well, and this is always tricky because you can make like some sort of joke and like kind of like dodge the question, uh, which is my first impulse. But let's not do that. Um, uh, I think for, for one word, um, you know, the, I, I can't come up with a specific word for it, but what I'm concerned with is, um, having some sort of like insight into how better understand the world. So what's a word for that? Understand the world, better insight on how to understand the world. We could say insightful, but that doesn't, the connotation on that is off. Is that wisdom? Sure. I'll yeah, I would, I would, I would say that's like wisdom. Cause like insightful, yeah. I think is too low level. Yeah. I don't, uh, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's like, well, that's an insightful comment. Like yeah. That. But like, I think like wisdom is, um. It's just like feeling it more in a yeah. deeper level. Yeah. Yeah. Wisdom is like you've restructured how someone perceives something, um, either like emotionally or like elevated their understanding of it. So let's go with that. It's a beautiful one. Thank you for coming here in traffic yeah. to do the show live. Happy to be here. I appreciate it, my man. Yeah. You've been listening to the Alpha Hippie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Alpha Hippie Podcast, everyone. Again, if you're enjoying the show, please subscribe and give us a rating on iTunes. My guests and I really appreciate the feedback. And if you're on Instagram, follow us at, at the Alpha Hippie to see what's going on in our world, upcoming shows, and all our news. See you next time.